Hello, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Janet Curran, and um, I have the privilege of introducing you to our speaker today, Dr. Christine Chambers. But before I introduce Christine, I just want to say that we're trialing a new um, strategy today, a new process for um, asking questions. And so while the, the presentation is ongoing, if a question comes to you that you want to um, ask Christine, if you could put it in the chat box, um, either at, from your site, put it in the chat, chat box, or if you've joined us um, at your, from your own PC at your desktop, um, again, just put it in the, the chat box. Um, and Christine will answer those questions at the end. I would like to ask you all, too, before we start, to make sure that your microphones are on mute. Feedback can be really distracting um, and prevents others from hearing. So if you just want to take 10 seconds to make sure that your microphone is on mute, that would be great. So um, Dr. Christine Chambers uh, is a Canada Research Chair in Children's Pain and Professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University. She is based at the Center for Pediatric Pain Research at the IWK Health Center, which happens to be co-located right, right next to our lab, so we're very privileged to be close to Christine. She has published over 130 peer-reviewed papers on the role of developmental, psychological, and social influences on children's pain, with a current research focus on the role of families in pediatric pain and social media for knowledge mobilization. Dr. Chambers is passionate about patient and family engagement, as evidenced in the award-winning CIHR-funded It Doesn't Have to Hurt Social Media Initiative. Over to you, Christine. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and thank you to KT Canada and the Maritime uh, for Support Unit for uh, offering this opportunity to tell you about this work that we've been doing over the last couple of years. And uh, I'm very keen for feedback and reactions. Uh, I am not a KT person by, by training or uh, expertise by any stretch, and so I'm very much looking uh, forward to your input and um, suggestions. Uh, so as Janet mentioned, uh, I am a pediatric pain scientist. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I'm broadly interested in the role of various uh, developmental and psychological and social factors in children's pain. And we know that children experience pain from a range of sources across their childhood, including routine vaccinations, uh, pain associated with surgery and injury, um, as well as pain uh, with chronic disease and, and um, chronic pain as well. And the factor that I focus mostly on in my research is the role of families. And you can see in this picture, although it's the baby who's getting the needle, it's the father who is feeling the child's pain. And this image really very much sums up most of the research that I've done on the role of parents, what parents say and do, and how that impacts children's pain experiences. This is the first paper that I published in the area of pain uh, just over 20 years ago now. Um, and again, you can see from a very early stage uh, an interest in parents and how we can better support parents in pain assessment and management. And I kind of fell into research by accident. I had assumed that I would be a clinician, um, but really got excited about how research could, I thought at the time, be used to impact uh, a much broader number of children and families than I could ever reach on my own as a clinician. So I've been engaged in lots of empirical studies over the years, um, and also done quite a lot of knowledge synthesis work in terms of uh, systematic reviews um, in different topic areas in children's pain, again with the goal of sort of synthesizing evidence um, so that it can be shared and hopefully used. In addition to our sort of knowledge generation and, and knowledge synthesis work, um, we've done uh, quite a bit of policy and guideline uh, development, uh, a vaccination pain guideline that I worked on with a colleague, Anna Tadio, and, and many, many others. Um, was uh, recently adopted um, components of it for um, recommendation by the World Health Organization. So um, you would think that this would be a success story and that I've, over the span of my career, been able to be engaged in lots of different aspects of the research process. Um, but as you'll learn shortly, um, you know, despite all of these research strengths, and I'll just give a shout out for our Center for Pediatric Pain Research here in Halifax, uh, which Faculty. Uh, Canada really is a world leader in children's pain research. There was a report on the state of science and technology in Canada in 2012 that was commissioned, and much to our surprise, um, children's pain management was identified as the top 
number one, the top research cluster um, in terms of contribution to uh, publication. Uh, and so um, this is great uh, to have all this research capacity, but what impact is all of this research having on children and families? And I can say that becoming a parent myself really opened my eyes uh, to the huge gap between knowledge and practice. Uh, my, I have four kids uh, who are now between the ages of six and 12, and I was really surprised to learn when we became patients ourselves for surgeries, hospitalizations, uh, injuries, emergency department visits, that um, the very research that I had dedicated my career to publishing in journals and presenting at conferences wasn't benefiting my own children when it came to their clinical care and pain management. So I had the opportunity on my last sabbatical in 2012 to uh, participate in a fellowship program offered by um, the Mayday Fund, which is a New York-based foundation. Um, and the goal of this fellowship is to train scientists and clinicians in media and advocacy and policy so that we can take research um, and make a difference for children. For the fellowship, I had to develop a platform. Um, for the year, I received training from a communications company um, and had a communications coach who worked with me on my goals uh, through the duration of the year. And the uh, platform that I adopted was that I wanted to reach parents with evidence-based information about children's pain. And uh, it was during this fellowship that I learned of the power of social media. And contrary to popular belief, I am not a very technologically oriented person. Um, anyone who's been in my office sees that I still print things to read. Um, so this is a bit of a leap for me. Uh, I had been on Facebook personally um, to uh, connect with high school friends, but I had really never thought of the role of social media as a way to engage um, with parents. But certainly, if you look at um, the usage rates of different types of social media, and this slide is already out of date, um, but millions and billions of people are using social media on, on a daily basis. It has become um, a modality through which people communicate and um, engage. And there's been a huge jump in the last 10 years. This is data from the Pew Research Center that shows a tenfold jump in the past decade. Um, of individuals using social media. So now roughly 65% of all adults use social media. That's not all online adults, that's all adults, you know, in general. Uh, there is a huge correlation with age. So younger people are far more likely to be using social media than older people. Um, uh, and I think that's particularly relevant when you think about the parenting or the parents and the sort of demographic group that I'm interested in reaching. I will say that when I first started doing work in this sort of scientific space on social media, I was met with a lot of skepticism, a lot of eye rolling. I got rejected uh, from a lot of conferences that I had been presenting my work at for a very long time. Um, but that started to change. This is a, an article that came out in Nature a couple of years ago now on the role of social media and the social network um, in science. And a number of other uh, major science outlets have started to recognize the value and contribution of social media in science. Uh, this is a figure that appeared in the Nature paper. Uh, they asked a subset of scholars, um, what do you use social media for? And as you can see here, they are using it in a variety of different ways to uh, post their own work or content, to follow discussions, to discover recommended papers. Um, so clearly a lot of different ways that scientists are using social media. Um, so I felt this was promising, um, however, there still is a lot of skepticism about the role of social media. Right after that Nature paper came out, this spoof from PhD Comics of the figure came out, which was, why do academics really use Twitter? Uh, you know, it gives me something to do during boring seminars, hopefully interact with people I have an intellectual crush on. Um, so even though we've made some progress in perhaps respecting or appreciating the role of social media, um, there's probably still a long, a long way to go. For parents, though, social media is an essential component of their everyday life. Uh, this is data from Baby Center showing that um, many moms are, are using social media, using their phones to take and share photos, that they're searching for parenting advice. 
Uh, and the platforms vary a little bit. Uh, Facebook still is the number one most popular social media platform among moms. Uh, but some newer data that's coming out is uh, showing um, that Instagram is particularly popular among younger moms. So I think the platforms that people are using are likely to change over time, but social media as a way of communicating and engaging um, is likely here to stay. And parents are using social media for parenting information. Uh, this is a, more data from the Pew Research Center showing that um, a large number of parents, so 59% uh, both mothers and fathers are finding parenting information when looking at social media content. They're receiving some sort of support um, on a parenting issue. And more importantly, they're asking parenting questions. So a third of parents are asking parenting questions online. Uh, Google has also done a really neat analysis of uh, what parents are looking for online. So every time you type search terms into Google, um, Google can analyze this based on different demographic factors. And Google has found that across different stages, so when mothers are pregnant, when they have a newborn, when they have a toddler, um, parenting searches related to health uh, trump all others. So health is the number one thing that parents are looking for online. Um, and this image went viral before the holidays last year. Uh, it says, please do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree. And a lot of my medical colleagues still will tell parents, don't go online to look at this, don't read, don't Google this, you know. And I say to those colleagues, you're insane. That ship has sailed. Of course parents are going to go online looking for health information about their child. You go online to research cars and what vacation you're going to go on. They are going to use the most accessible tool. Um, to research the most important thing in their life. So then the issue in my mind becomes um, not should parents go online to look for health information, but rather what will they find when they go looking and what obligation do we have as health professionals to make sure that they encounter evidence-based content when they do go online. So this was the idea behind a brief video that we created um, as part of my fellowship. It went online uh, four years ago now. It's just a brief two-minute video, um, and we can send some links around later. I, um, the video won't work in this format, um, but I can, I can send around some links. It was funded by the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, and in this video, a little girl shares um, her ideas on how parents can make pain management uh, easier for their children. We worked with the communications company. Um, they came up with the concept and um, produced the video for us. And this was really hard for me because um, I'm used to researchers, you know, we like to include lots of information and citation and detail. And researchers are great at creating the most boring videos you're ever going to watch. They're terrible. They're 45 minutes. Um, and this video, I was told, had to be less than two and a half minutes uh, because that's the average view duration on YouTube, that was four years ago. Now, the video view duration on social media is even smaller. They recommend 30 to 60 second snippets of video. Um, so this was a really challenging project for me to give up my control freak and comprehensiveness um, and trust um, that these people know what they're doing when it comes to communicating. I made sure the science was accurate, um, but they uh, took the lead in the communication. So we let the video go live, and I learned probably my most important lesson, which is not only is it hard for scientists to create compelling content for parents, um, but I also learned that we simply don't have the reach to get it in front of all of the people who could benefit. Uh, so I like the saying, if you build it, they won't necessarily come. I used my entire small grant to produced the video, put it online, I emailed every person I knew, I um, emailed listservs, I wrote newsletter articles, um, and then eventually I just ran out of people to contact, yet I knew that there were so many more parents who could benefit, I just didn't have a way to reach them. We are, our, our professional circles are, are, are pretty limited in many ways, even when you have partners who are willing to help you. So I started tweeting. Um, my lab had signed me up for a Twitter account, and I had actually gone to a Twitter workshop, and 
I had uh, provided an evaluation that I thought it would be useless and a waste of time. Um, but then when I had no alternative, um, I figured I'd better figure out how to do this. So from my sofa, uh, on my iPad, after my kids would go to bed, I started trying to figure Twitter out um, and realized that it provided an incredible way to engage with influencers um, like Andre Picard from the Globe and Mail, Health Reporter, um, and uh, various other groups and organizations as well as the media. And every time I was able to engage an influencer who cared about my message or my content area, and they shared our video, we were able to watch a huge jump in the number of views. We could literally track this on YouTube. Uh, this is just one example of the kind of uh, sharing and engagement we had. So today's parent, who has millions of Twitter followers, um, got wind of our, our video after I targeted them and uh, we're sharing it. So again, just an example of trying to get our science-based information in front of sort of the, the parenting media where so many parents go, but typically uh, the content is not evidence-based and isn't rooted in science. So just to give you an idea, um, in terms of our, our analysis of the video, we have a paper going in about this shortly, but we have over 210,000 views to date, which um, is hardly going viral by, you know, Gangnam style standards, but by health research standards, it's pretty good. Um, we really haven't done anything to actively promote the video since it's uh, just after its launch, but it just continues to tick away through word of mouth and, and people coming across it on its own. Interestingly, people only viewed 60% of the video, um, and if you watch the video, you'll see that that's precisely when the little girl disappears and the summary slides that I insisted on having at the end appear. Um, and the communications company told me, don't do that. Don't summarize the points at the end. Our, our user groups are saying it's boring. And I'm like, no, we need to have summary slides at the end, and they were right. Um, in terms of viewers, you can see it was mostly women um, and in age ranges um, that were uh, typically sort of uh, parenting age ranges. Uh, we also had a subset of parents fill out questionnaires as well as health professionals about how much they liked the video, how helpful the video was, whether they felt more confident now um, in managing their child's pain and whether the next needle would be uh, less painful. And as you can see, um, the responses were generally quite positive. In terms of adoption of the strategies in the video, there were three strategies we recommended, which was deep breathing, distraction, and a topical anesthetic cream. And you can see that both parents and clinicians had significant um, increases in their uh, intention to use the strategies of uh, deep breathing and topical anesthetics. For uh, distraction, people were already engaging in fairly high levels of that strategy, so there weren't uh, significant increases there. Um, so all this to say, I started tweeting about a lot of stuff, um, and one of the things that I appreciate is when people tweet about newly published papers they've read, and this is the number one way that I find out about papers now. Um, so this is an article that I read out of Alberta um, on a Sunday night uh, that I sent a tweet about showing that um, there was more disappointing evidence of uh, pain management in kids in emergency departments. Um, and uh, it was interesting because Andre Picard, the health reporter at the Globe and Mail, saw this tweet and he um, messaged me and he said, could you send me a copy of the paper? And I thought, well, isn't that interesting that Canada's leading health reporter can't access the science that we keep behind a paywall? Um, but I sent him the paper and um, a couple of ours as well on, on the same topic. Um, and he replied and said, I, I want to write a piece about this. Can I talk to you tomorrow? And I was like, okay. The next day, this very powerful piece appeared in the Globe and Mail, um, Children's Pain Get Short Shrift. It's improved since the days when kids went without, but research shows they still don't get enough relief. And it is by far the best piece that has ever been written in the media about children's pain, um, partly because uh, he had been following me on Twitter and he had been learning my messages and every sentence in this article I felt um, was very much um, in tune with the messaging that I had been trying to send. Um, and it said to me, isn't this insane that um, through one tweet uh, we can shrink the gap between sort of knowledge and public awareness, um, taking a paper that was in a paywall journal on a Sunday night into the sort of mass media um, in a powerful piece on a Tuesday. And there actually is a whole evidence that is evolving around the role of social media in dissemination of science. Um, this is just one example, um, and there are many studies coming out in, the, in this area now. Um, but tweeting does appear to 
um, increase um, page views and downloads, and people are now uh, tracking this in terms of whether it impacts um, citations and people's H indexes and um, journal impact factors as well. Just to give you one example before I kind of jump into telling you the rest about it, our, where we took this work with It Doesn't Have to Hurt, um, I was on a social media working group for our journal, Pain, um, and uh, they have these cool articles which are called Pain Picture, where there's this 500-word um, summary, and then you work with an artist um, to create a picture, an image that uh, accompanies the piece. And these are open access and people can download the images to use in their teaching and in slides. So it's a great resource for people. So we uh, did a trial of um, tweeting, just sent one tweet about this paper and attached the image. Um, and in two weeks, it became um, the second most downloaded paper of the year um, in pain just as a result of this one tweet. And that was in April. And at the end of the year, it was still um, the second most downloaded paper of the year. The most downloaded paper was a paper, it was a systematic review on opioid misuse, which is kind of a hot topic these days. Do I think that facial expression of pain um, is the second hottest topic in pain right now? No, um, it had to do with our dissemination strategy. So all this to say, uh, I am a scientist, and I'm not this kind of scientist, um, but I do have work to do, and I have my hands full at home. And while it doesn't take a lot of money to do this, um, it was taking a lot of my time. And so I started thinking, I'm a scientist, get me out of here, but is there a better way that we can leverage the power of social media um, to bring parents important science information? And uh, one of the tweets that I had sent early on had targeted a parenting forum called YMC, Yummy Mummy Club, run by Erica M. And uh, she had picked up on the, on the video and had even had a blogger uh, write a blog post about the video. And again, we would experienced a huge jump in the number of views when, um, when, we, um, when, she, when this blog went live. And so that gave me an idea, which was, why am I trying to create compelling content for parents? I'm not a digital marketing expert. I'm not, I am a mom, but I don't know the effective strategies to market to parents. There are people who do this for a living. Um, and also there are people like her who have a reach um, that's far greater to my target audience than I have. And when I looked in depth at their reach, this was their reach slide at the time, across all their different social media platforms and influencer networks, they were reaching 5 million Canadian, people, uh, Canadian moms primarily um, per month. And that number is up to 6 million a month now. So again, could we leverage this network um, to get parents scientific information? So I uh, tweeted at Erica and a few of the other um, parenting um, uh, magazines and had meetings with them all in Toronto and in the end decided to work with Erica and her team at YMC. Um, we wrote a grant together to the uh, CIHR's Knowledge to Action Program as co-PI. She was the knowledge user co-PI um, and were funded uh, to um, run a two-year project. Uh, and the grant really capitalized on the rise of branded content. So. Uh, branded content models are very predominant in marketing, marketing these days. And when you think about branding in general, it's what makes us feel comfortable with our purchases and choices. Um, so it's why I just went and got a Diet Pepsi, for example. Um, and in health, I believe we haven't done a very good job at all at leveraging uh, brand marketing and establishing um, brand reputation around health information. Um, People often talk about the brand of different health centers um, and different children's hospitals have brands, but I believe that by branding health information, um, we can help parents navigate um, the digital space. And you know, 10 years ago, the problem was that there wasn't enough information online for parents. Now we have the reverse problem. There is far too much information. Parents can't tell what to believe. And the problem is that, again, we scientists do a terrible job at making our really good content look good. We create terrible websites, we create terrible videos, um, and parents dismiss them. Um, and the sites that create flashy, contemporary, 
um, you know, really sculpted looking content, parents think that that's credible. Um, so that's a problem. So what we tried to do was bring these two worlds together and create a brand and content campaign called It Doesn't Have to Hurt. Um, and in this campaign, we brought together the best scientists in Canada who study children's pain, basic scientists, clinical scientists across development. Uh, we also brought together scientists who have expertise in um, knowledge translation and user-centered design and health communication. Brought them together with Erica M. and her team of digital marketers and content creators and influencers at YMC. Uh, so again, we had our research team led by myself, YMC, led by Erica. Uh, we had a parent panel, so parents were actively engaged um, in the entire process of developing the research questions, uh, helping us choose measures, uh, providing input on content. Uh, all the content that we, we created, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, would always go to the research team uh, for science review, um, but to the parents um, for their perspective. Um, there were often some disagreements between what the research team felt and what the parent panel felt, and it was interesting to have to navigate that. We had uh, three very committed partners, the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, and the Canadian Pain Coalition. Um, because this was and is the smallest, shortest grant in my career, I had to call in favors from all kinds of companies, mostly in the Halifax area, um, who were so good at appreciating the vision that we had and um, being willing to, to be a part of it and, and contribute some resources and expertise. So we launched on September 21st, 2015 with a live event at the Halifax Central Library. Um, in addition to the live event, which was um, webcammed uh, or video streamed um, internationally, uh, we also uh, had a significant uh, social media component of tweeting during the event. Uh, and we brought in um, different people, with, including parents, Andre Picard from The Globe, Eric M from YMC, to have a conversation about how social media can be used to um, get evidence to parents in pain, but in other areas as well. So to give you an idea of what our content looks like, there are blog posts, and again, how this worked is the research, parents would let us know the topics that they were struggling with with regard to pain in their children. So it's very much parent-driven in terms of topics. The research team would synthesize the evidence um, on the topic. Sometimes there were systematic reviews, sometimes there weren't, um, literally into one page of bullet points of here are the key factoids about this particular topic. We would then hand that one page over to Erica and her team at YMC, who would literally knowledge translate it into compelling digital content. So these are the blog posts. I'll show you some other content in a few minutes. Um, and again, everything would come back to the scientists and the parents for their mutual approval before it went live. When it did go live, um, Erica would then push it out over her network of uh, 5 million Canadian parents. We had videos um, where parents shared their stories, and again, their stories were interwoven with evidence-based medicine um, and evidence-based you know, facts about children's pain. And what we know in social media is that people often rate um, anecdote and stories shared by others as more compelling than evidence. So our goal was to weave these personal narratives with evidence so that when parents were watching it, they wouldn't even know that we were sharing science. It was a parent story, but it's embedded. And again, everything was branded as it doesn't have to hurt. So anything that came through that a parent saw, it was all branded so they knew they could trust it as part of the initiative. And you can see here, there were times where our communications partners uh, prompted or urged us to adopt slightly edgier strategies for messaging than I would normally feel comfortable with in an academic environment. So, you know, how a bikini wax inspired a mom to help her daughter's pain would not have been my idea for a title. And some of the scientists on my team who are quite conservative were, like, appalled. Um, but Eric and her team uh, knew what would it get moms to click and actually watch videos. We had Facebook polls where um, parents would be asked questions about what they do, um, urging them to you know, check out this blog post and then come back to us and tell us, have you ever used these before? 
They would incentivize um, moms, um, and it contributed to an incredible conversation and dialogue of parents um, sharing stories and learning. My favorite component of the campaign are the Instagram images, uh, and I don't even use Instagram. I don't get it, but I think these are beautiful. Um, and so uh, when you think about it, you know, breastfeeding and needles equals it doesn't have to hurt. That's dozens of randomized control trials that have been published in the literature, summarized in, you know, systematic reviews for the Cochrane collaboration. But really, what's the take-home message for a parent? Those three words and the image. Um, and again, these were really, really powerful and very popular with parents um, as part of the campaign. Another component which provided a lot of engagement were our Twitter parties. So for those of you who don't know what a Twitter party or a Twitter chat is, it's when people gather at a designated time online, usually an hour, with a particular hashtag and engage in a conversation. And it can generate a lot of interaction and a lot of sharing. Um, and people can do these Twitter parties. Anyone can say they're going to have a Twitter party, but you might have a Twitter party and no one's going to show up. But again, leveraging our partner um, and their established forum for hosting these and their reach, we had huge responses um, to these Twitter parties. And we would link parents to resources. Um, and you can see here, we actually crashed the Sick Kids server, uh, directing so many parents to um, a uh, linked pain assessment resource that was on their website. And this is just a great example for me here of um, uh, parents talking about how they have a redheaded child and her hearing that they're more sensitive to pain. Is this true? And one of the basic scientists on our team who actually did some of those studies in his lab was able to answer her. So again, bringing science in a more accessible way to parents. Uh, and we had so much success with our Twitter parties that Twitter Canada uh, reached out to us and said, we'd like to host you for a live event um, at our headquarters. Please bring everybody who's been involved in the project, from the parents to the organizations, the content creators, the parents who share their stories, to our headquarters. Um, and they allowed us to use their um, video Q&A app, which previously they had only enabled for the prime minister and athletes and celebrities. But they allowed us, during our Twitter party, to use the app to be able to answer parents' questions live over video, which I will tell you is the scariest thing I have ever done. You have 30 seconds to be able to succinctly answer the parents' question before the app cuts you off. Um, and we trended number one in Canada that night, which as someone who's been trying to get people to talk about children's pain for 20 years was uh, really exciting to see. Our content's been featured in their newsletters, and uh, my whole vision with this strategy was you know, to position information about children's pain where parents are already going. Um, so parents might not even know that there's something they could do for their child's vaccination pain, but they might be looking for Halloween costume ideas or, as this says, you know, creative toy storage solutions, and then happen to see um, a link to content on stomach aches and headaches or vaccination pain. Um, so again, trying to position evidence in front of parents, going to where the parents are, instead of trying to make parents come to us, which was my mistake with the YouTube video, and I think a mistake that most people doing um, knowledge translation with parents need. Uh, and there was just a lot of discussion online, and my goal was to create publicly accessible information that parents could share with each other. Um, and we've had lots of examples of screenshots of closed Facebook groups where parents are asking, you know, I'm taking my kids for needles tomorrow, what should I do? And another parent answers, linking in our content, um, instead of the non-evidence-based answers that they would often provide before. We generated a lot of uh, media interest in this project, uh, featured in the New York Times and on national um, CBC news as well. And we actually are communicating with a communications professor at Mount St. Vincent to do media analysis of uh, all of the media work on this project. And I'll just close now by briefly talking about evaluation. Um, wow, this has been a really fun project, and it's, I believe, been very impactful. It's been very challenging to think about from a rigorous, um, you know, design and methodology perspective. I tell people it's like the worst research design in my career. How on earth can you study this kind of intervention in a controlled way? You really can't. Um, and so I'll tell you what we tried to do, um, and this is certainly something I'd love input on as we move forward. Um, this is one component, um, and just to give you an idea of the power of partnerships, 
those of us doing research with parents are always trying to get people to fill out surveys. YMC, again, used their hub to disseminate our surveys for us. Um, and in less than two weeks, they got over 2,000 parents to complete our surveys. Um, and we had asked for a subset of parents who did the surveys to uh, do phone interviews, and we were hoping for 30. And over 500 parents said they wanted to be interviewed in the two weeks we had before we launched. Um, and we were able to interview over 200. Um, but again, it's just an efficient way to do research, not just share um, and engage about research. And this topic of how do we know if social media campaigns improve health is something that my colleague, Holly Winneman, and I um, have uh, hosted a, um, a Twitter chat about and have done a little bit of writing about as well. Uh, it's not easy. So in terms of the evaluation, uh, what do we have? Uh, we have post-campaign measure, measures of reach and engagement. We're using a framework that quantifies um, you know, whether people saw something, whether they liked it, whether they shared it, whether they commented on it. Um, and as you imagine, we have an incredible amount of content to track that for. Um, our summary, overall summary stat at the end of the 12-month period was that we had our content had over 130 million content views worldwide. As I mentioned, we did uh, pre-post parent online surveys with over 2,000 parents and phone interviews with 200 parents. In an attempt to try to have a control group, um, we hired a survey panel company to um, conduct our survey with a matched group of parents on age, sex, and demographics um, so that we would have data at the post time point to compare um, to the uh, parents who've been engaged in, in the content online. We're also using social listening software that was gifted to us by Sysmos, a social listening company, to track the hashtag and follow uh, essentially key search terms about children's pain online. And finally, we have a number of sub-studies that are underway um, that we're collaborating with different faculty, on, mostly junior faculty on. They're taking the leads on these components. I mentioned the media analysis. We're also conducting a formal evaluation of our partnership that's led by um, a colleague at Laval. Uh, we also have been conducting a formal evaluation of our parent engagement. Um, there's very little in the literature in terms of um, evidence around the role of parent engagement in research, uh, and NSHRS has been very helpful with this. Uh, we also have a collaboration that's developing with a computer science prop here at Dalhousie to look at a content analysis of all of the social media content. As you might imagine, we have generated a ton of data um, and are super under-resourced uh, to actually um, properly and thoroughly um, maximize all of it. So we're always keen to collaborate. People uh, have ideas or um, see something in here that fits with your research program, I'd love to chat with you. And my last thing I'll close with uh, is I uh, need to learn a lot more about KT, and I've been trying um, in different ways. But if there's a postdoc or someone thinking of a postdoc out there with expertise in KT theory, methods, and evaluation, even if you've never heard of pain before, um, we have a, a, a lot of opportunity, I think, um, with the data we have and also some of the ways that we're scaling up this work right now. So that's me um, and our goal, improved pain management for children around the world um, and trying to leverage the power of social media um, and partnerships to make that happen. So thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. So thank you, Christine. I'm exhausted <laughs> <laughs> with this whirlwind, comprehensive tour of, of your work so far. So congratulations. That's very impressive. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I, while I'm asking my questions, if folks could think about, do you have questions? And if you do, um, you could let the moderator know by uh, signal, signaling in the chat box. So I have many questions. So I'll, I'll start with. Um, I'll start with. Um, can you tell us a little bit about if if those on the line who are listening wanted to get started with this foray. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the types of important resources, partnerships? You did describe some of your partnerships in your presentation, but if you were to pick three or four um, key, key uh, events or partnerships that helped you get to where you are, right. because you were blindly finding your way in yeah. the beginning and you expressed that you're not a social media expert. Yeah. So 
but you've done great work with this. So can you tell us what you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the things that I've come to appreciate is, um, I'll steal this line from a, a parent partner of ours in our research, is the importance of staying in your lane. Um, and I think that, I don't know why as scientists, I think it starts in grad school, I don't know, where we still have to do everything ourselves, um, and that we have to become experts in everything. And I think that, um, you know, appreciating the limits in your own expertise, and then identifying people who have expertise that you need. I also think for me, it was a bit of a, an eye opener to think of approaching unconventional partners, right? Like we tend to partner with health organizations or other scientists or clinicians or hospitals. But I think there's a whole other world out there outside of the academic bubble um, mm -hmm. who, who are probably um, much better partners for us. And who, I mean, when I approached Erica, and, and I think sometimes we're just scared or we don't have a way. And so social media became the portal through which I could actually get on these people's radars from my sofa in Halifax, Nova Scotia, right? Like, um, but I think don't be afraid to ask um, and, you know, try to think outside the box a little bit. Um, and honestly, I think for me, becoming a parent just really opened my eyes to uh, sort of two worlds collided for me. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. Um, so I think, you know, trying to think creatively, brainstorm, um, think about people outside of your academic world and what they might have to offer. Um, and again, when I approached Erica, I mean, she was just like, I was thinking she would be doing me a favor. And she's like, are you kidding? You have all this great science proven information about children's health that we're going to share on my platform. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. she's like, this is a win-win for both of us. And I think finding that sweet spot in a partnership where it is truly mutually beneficial um, was a real sort of, I guess, learning point for me. And can I ask, yeah. then building on that, that's a successful one. Did you yeah. reach out to many people, though, that didn't get back to you? Just so folks don't yeah. think that it's that easy that you reach out to someone and find somebody like Cinderella. Yeah, so I had experience as part of a larger grant application where you needed to have partners um, mm -hmm. the year before I got the idea for this project. And honestly, we didn't get that grant. So there's the, you know, um, and it, it took four months of an entire summer. And But it was the first time I had to pitch to people and approach partners. And a lot of people turned me down, but a lot of people said yes. Yeah. And I realized, oh, I can do this. Um, and I did, I did approach three partners, um, and they all, for this particular project, they were all willing and interested to do it, and I was in the position of being able to choose. And um, I consulted with our industry liaison office. I would also like to give a plug to um, that office here at the University, Doris Grant in particular, who um, really helped prep me to get me in front of partners and think about how I should approach it from their world. Um, but um, there have been other projects um, and other partnerships, I will say, um, that haven't uh, haven't gone the same way. Mm -hmm. So this pro and this is why we're really keen to um, do this partnership evaluation that's in progress right now because we'd like to learn like why was it that this particular mm -hmm. partnership took off when other partnerships that we've tried um, you know haven't had the same sort of synergy. Mm -hmm. So, Jessica? Hi there. Um, hi. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, you have one question from Queens. Queens, would you mind um, seeing your question? Thanks very much for your presentation, Christine. That was really enjoyable. One of the things that we try to teach our undergrad students is sort of um, seeing the forest from the tree like what content online can be trusted and what content maybe shouldn't be trusted. And we know that there are lots of blogs out there that don't put as much time and attention into posting evidence-based research vetted, researcher vetted content. And so I'm just wondering what Yummy Mummy Club strategy was for sort of um, letting readers know that the content that was generated through your intensive process was evidence-based and could be trusted, perhaps more so than other content on their website, unless they somehow have the capacity to do this for all, all their posts? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think it really gets back to the branded content model that we used. So every piece of content on, you know, that was related to this project had the, the logo and the hashtag, it doesn't have to hurt, which included a description of what it doesn't have to hurt was. 
and a link back to our own uh, landing page for the project that described it. So parents could very easily tell, oh, and you know, every piece of content that was shared had the hashtag, it doesn't have to hurt. So that was really how they were able to differentiate for parents, this can be trusted. And they did a wonderful job at the launch of setting it up for their readers, letting, introducing their readers to me and to our research team and saying for the next year, you know, we're going to be sharing evidence-based content with you in this campaign called It Doesn't Have to Hurt, every bit of this content. And it just kept, and of course, we were always in their face. Like this brought the scientists into parents, you know, living rooms and on their phones. Um, so the science was very transparent. So again, I think it, it was very much this science media partnership, very different than you know a, a blog where you know they interviewed a scientist or a clinician and quoted them. Everything was co-created and then sort of marketed as such. So. Okay, Jessica, I believe we have uh, some more questions from the audience. Uh, yes, so two more. So one question was, uh, they were curious about the framework you use to evaluate reach and engagement. Right, so the framework we're using is um, is one that has been used in the social media literature by Niger. Um, and certainly if you're interested in the, the source, you could email me and I can send it to you. Um, but it, it creates um, a, a bit of a hierarchy around um, you know, the different types of analytics that you can gather. And we've also been drawing from some of the marketing literature because, you know, when, when people run campaigns for Huggies, for example, um, you know, they have to report back to Huggies about how many people saw the content and what are these different levels of engagement. And it was fascinating for me to see why would some Facebook or, you know, blog posts result in a ton of likes, but then not a lot of sharing. Um, and then sometimes, a blog post would get like a ton of shares, but not a lot of likes. And you know, so these are the things that we have data on all this that we, which we need to mine further in terms of what does all of that mean. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, um, you want to. And this is the thing about this project is I can't tell for sure um, or prove for sure that a single child got better pain management as a result of this. I mean, the challenge is those of you in knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization know is measuring impact, right? And just because people saw it um, and say they were going to use it um, doesn't mean they actually did. Um, and, you know, that kind of deeper evaluation is, is really challenging. Um, you know, this is easier in marketing when your goal is to sell diapers. Um, and that's called a conversion um, in the marketing world when you see something online and then you say click on it to buy something. Um, that is the ultimate win in marketing, right? Like, and that's a conversion, so that's what they measure. Um, but what's the conversion for us? Um, you know, and how do you measure that in a, in a way that's actually feasible other than, you know, popping into your parents' lives, following them around and, and studying them. Um, you really have to go on their report. I should mention that we did follow up with parents a year later. So we followed up with that large sample, as many of them as we could reach a year later. Because the other thing is, you know, you might learn about something like how to manage your child's pain in the emergency department, but your child may not have had an emergency visit. Mm -hmm. um, but a year later, it was amazing to see how many parents were like, oh, yeah, my kid ended up having day surgery this year. Um, and we used the evidence. So it's very challenging at that end. And last question is, uh, were there any effective communication strategies that helped facilitate conversations between the researchers and YMC? Yeah, I mean, I think the way that, you know, YMC communicates with parents all the time is what they sort of carried over into this project. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, the, the things that I learned from Erica that engage people are things that make them laugh and things that make them cry. Um, and so that was really a guiding principle um, for engagement. Um, oh, there was something else that just popped into my head when you said that. Um, I lost it. But uh, yeah, I think you know, connecting with parents on emotion. Um, and um, yeah, I, I really think those are the strategies. But you know, the way that we word things, I mean, it was really something for me I mean, I've talked and written about children's pain in any millions of different ways. It was amazing to see our evidence turn back to us in parent speak in ways that I never could have thought of myself ever. I have a question. 
um, for the, knowing that the many in the line are also trainees, yeah. and when you began your journey using social media, you were you had an established CV. So for those who are who are thinking about the importance of publication, our traditional ways in academia to we measure success, um, how what suggestions might you give them to balance the need to use social media for dissemination and exchange? versus um, the traditional metrics that academic, yeah. academics follow. I'm glad you pointed that out because I do think my career stage um, has given me um, a lot of flexibility in being able to explore some different, different things. So I do have the publications. I do have the scientific credentials. And believe me, even then, there are a lot of people who are like, what is this yummy mummy bikini wax? Erica M. from Much Music. I mean, there was a lot of skepticism, um, and I'm somebody who um, doesn't mind controversy and whatever, so I was comfortable with that. What I recommend for younger people is you, publications are still um, what you will build your career on, and that needs to be your primary focus. Um, that said, the academic world is shifting. Um, so Mayo Clinic, for, or um, yeah, Mayo Clinic uh, recently uh, amended their promotion guidelines for their faculty um, to include um, more creative uh, academic activities. Um, and other universities like the University of Toronto, for example, um, has a pretty um, impressive uh, approach to thinking about creative academic activity. So I do think that we are in a space where these types of activities um, are going to be appreciated better. Uh, and I do think having a Twitter account is like the easiest free tool that you can have to promote your publications and to create a brand about yourself and your science and to differentiate yourself from other people. Should that take away from doing quality science and publishing and doing all the things you normally should do? Definitely not. Um, but I think I would view it for trainees as something that could be used to augment or uh, accentuate um, their strategies. I'll give a shout out to my trainee, uh, Perry Tuttleman, who's here in the room. Um, who's done a really fantastic job um, on Twitter at networking, establishing relationships, sharing information um, in a way that has really improved her science. It's been a, not a distraction, it's been an enhancement. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think we'll draw it to a close if there's no more questions um, outside of the room. I didn't ask if there were questions inside of the room, which you don't have to put it on a chat box. <laughs> Was there, are there any questions? Yeah. So um, I want to thank everyone for attending um, and remind you about your evaluations that you need to email to Megan. Uh, the next session is on February 8th with Dr. Um, Mammon Joyce Dogma, Dogma from Laval University. She's leading up our partnership evaluations. <laughs> there you go. Perfect, perfect relationship at this point. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.